Yes, well, we're ready to begin. Thank you so much all for coming. And most particularly, thank you, Mimi, for coming and having a conversation with, uh, with our community. Mimi is a, a distinguished past and long connections with Yale. Um, while she went to undergrad in a school across the country, hmm. um, uh, she nevertheless came to Yale for her PhD in art history. Um, and has been part of Yale really ever since, serving on the Yale Corporation, serving as a curator at the Yale Art Gallery, and then the director of the Yale Art Gallery until she was, I guess, lured away by the Seattle uh, Museum, where she spent many very uh, productive years, both from the point of view of her contribution to the art world in Seattle and to the business uh, of the museum itself. Um, and now is on many corporations, I guess you have officially retired from the right. museum, but uh, continue to be active on boards of many museums and in much activity, and agree to come back to, uh, to Yale to regale us with your stories. Mimi, some of you may um, know, who know her well, uh, speaks her mind, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure we're all in for a treat as a result. Yeah, no. So I'm going to ask some questions for a, a while and then open it up for questions from the audience. But I think it's, uh, it's an informal kind of a setting. So, Well, I'll, I'll just say what a pleasure it is to be here. Uh, I, I am who I am in part because of Yale. It really instilled values in me. And the experiences I had here really shaped who I am and what I accomplished. So. It's always a pleasure to come back and having been on the corporation. And I have particular affection for the Yale Art Gallery, uh, which is just a, the finest university museum there is and gets more so all the time under Jock Reynolds' leadership. And Jock is visiting us here today. For those of you interested in the <laughs> arts, he's, he's done wonderful things with our art gallery for those of you who haven't visited it recently. So welcome and welcome to everybody else who's coming to SOM. I hope you've had a chance to look at our beautiful facility itself, a piece of art, I think. So uh, Mimi, I want to start. You know my work has been in nonprofit management mm -hmm. as yours from an academic point of view. So you know, you, I look at your resume and you, know, you came as a PhD in art history and began on the curatorial side doing important scholarly work and important curatorial work in the uh, area of uh, East Asia. And then, you know, they recruited you to the dark side of management, um, <laughs> first running uh, our own art gallery and then in Seattle. I wondered if you can talk a little bit about uh, the central lessons on nonprofit management you've gleaned over the years, and maybe tell up along the way a few stories about the transition from that curatorial side to the management side. Are there things that surprised you about running something. I must say, when I became dean, I was surprised about how much I had to learn at an old age about <laughs> uh, running an institution. So talk to us a little bit about the transition and about the lessons of management. Well, I guess, I guess going from the curatorial side, which I really loved, and I, I, I loved the works of art. I loved having the option to teach. I loved doing exhibitions. And when I was first uh, asked to interview for directorships, I, I rather resisted it. And actually, when I was right at the transition between Bart Giamatti and Benno Schmidt, and when they interviewed me and then Benno offered me the job, I actually turned it down. And I had a grant to go to China to do research, and it was something I had dreamed of for a long time. But after a couple of weeks, I decided I'd made a bad decision. And I called the head of the search committee and asked that my name be put back in. Uh, some of you know Jules Brown. He was head of the search committee. And he said, fine, on one condition, that you promise me you won't take your name out again. <laughs> so anyway, so there I ended up as, as the director. Mm -hmm. I knew the institution, which was really an advantage. I knew the collections to some degree, but I did, I, ha, I had a tremendous amount to learn. Uh, I certainly, uh, in terms of budget and finance, mm -hmm. I hadn't had to deal with that. 
And so I've fortunately, I mean, one thing I've realized as directors in terms of knowing what your own weaknesses are is that the knowledge of art was a strength. And in the areas I didn't know, I could learn from the curators. But I needed a really strong CFO. Uh, and that's what I made sure I had. And fortunately, uh, we had somebody in place, Louisa Cunningham, who was tremendous. Because working with the complexities of the university and finance was a challenge. Um, I did discover that I had good people skills. And, and then I really I had to think strategically how to use those to advantage. Uh, one thing I did do, there was one person on the staff who I knew I could, could not work with. And I, I did talk to the human resource department which I had learned earlier to do that because I'd fired somebody without doing that and I got into trouble. But I did, and I actually changed somebody's job description. And as a result, the person said they would retire. So uh, that was the outcome that I had hoped for. So I, I was lucky and I gave myself one month to do that because I knew that, that was a critical position. Um, in terms of other things, I had to learn to work with the university. I mean, working with the administration, how to be an advocate for the museum, but also to, to understand the other challenges facing the university. And also how something Jock has done brilliantly, how to really integrate the museum into the infrastructure of the university, into its intellectual fabric and how to think what did you want this institution to be. So it, that actually inspired me. And so, so how much fundraising did you, did you have to do running the art gallery at the time? Because that, I would have thought, would have also been a new skill. Um, that was a new skill, and going to meet with foundations, with the Mellon Foundation. The museum at the time had a huge need for conservation. There had been a bad history in the past of two people who, uh, who addressed the issues of deterioration in the early Italian paintings, and you could not undo what they did, but you could see that that never happened again and that conservation became a really important, it should be an port, important part of any museum and given the excellence of Yale's collections. And the fact that now conservation is growing and growing and this is Center for Cultural Heritage on West Campus uh, is, I'm proud to have at least planted the seed on that, on way back when for that. But that was thanks to the Mellon Foundation who I went to see, and they said, well, if you can get a uh, proposal in in one month's time, we can take care of it right away. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to fund a conservator. And I did have to go out. I, I think as a young person, I was fairly shy. <laughs> and so getting over the fear of asking people for money and realizing that if you're passionate and if you're really committed to what you're doing, then fundraising's fun. And also realizing the worst that can happen is somebody will say no. Mm -hmm. And that's OK. But I went to Chicago to ask somebody for, the, for their reunion gift. And it was a major collector. And I can remember I had to ask. I asked him for $75,000, which to me seemed uh, immense. And I got on the airplane, and my head was throbbing. And the next day he called and he said, you have it. <laughs> so uh, anyway. So you obviously showed some latent talent there. So right? that was a start. Mm -hmm. And then in Seattle, in the end, we did a $150 million campaign to build a sculpture park on the waterfront and expand the museum. So that was two capital projects at once. And that was a spectacular success artistically as well as it sounds like financially. Right. Oh. And I think. You know, really thinking strategically, what are you going to do with this institution? What, do, what direction are you going to take it? And setting goals, and, and then 
once you once you get close to completion, what's what's your next challenge? And how to make it, how can you maximize what it is? What are your mission and values? And I think that is really critical, is in talking about your mission all the time. I uh, used to meet with the leaders of corporations in Seattle uh, about once a month. I used to meet with one person and have breakfast and talk to them. And I can, the one, one person who I really remember vividly was from Starbucks. And Seattle is now the, the headquarters for Amazon and Starbucks and Boeing. And you know, it's got this huge growth spurt. And Oren Smith, who worked with Howard, Howard Smith at, I mean, Howard Schultz at Starbucks, he said to me, mission, mission, mission. Don't you ever have a meeting when you don't talk about your mission and what you're about? And he said that something that is part of the Starbucks culture mm -hmm. is you know, not, not in the same way. I mean, you have to make it interesting. Mm -hmm. But uh, that, that it is really critical. And how much is that also part of managing your internal staff? I mean, one of the things about a nonprofit is so many of the people, as you know, in an art gallery, this must especially be true on the curatorial side and in the rest of it, are passionate about what they do, but it doesn't necessarily they do mean that they're going to want to do what you want them to do. Right. Indeed, sometimes that passion makes them want to do exactly what you don't want them to do. Right. So how do you think about bringing the staff on board with your ideas? I think, I think having a vision, talking about it, being open, being a good communicator, and, and pulling people together so sort they're of going in the same direction. And it is hard because inevitably you, some, you have people who with whom wouldn't be the person you would pick or somebody who can't buy into your vision. And then that's an issue. Mm -hmm. And in, in this nonprofit that we are part of, and it's true, I think, actually, of a number of nonprofits, getting rid of people is very difficult. Right. Actually, and this is probably a no, but one of the reasons uh, the Seattle Art Museum had great appeal to me because it was the one institution that had a separate building for Asian art, and Chinese art is my passion, and it also had no unions. <laughs> and so, you know, from my perspective, because I felt really strongly about hiring a senior team, and it's not that I'm anti-union or anything, but in terms of being able to put together your own team, I knew that it would be faster. And actually, I think for a CEO, for me, who you hire in your senior team is really one of the most critical responsibilities. And this is something actually Jock pointed out at a meeting earlier today, is it's really a team-based effort and yes, you're like the symphony conductor. You're, you're the one who's leading the team. But you also need to have people who you want to work with on that senior team. And that's a really com critical component. And how to hire people who are knowledgeable, who are intelligent, and who you know could be part of your team, and who also shore up your weaknesses. I knew, I know, I don't think in numbers. <laughs> and so I'd always thought of going to business school and people would say, no, you're too far along. You have to be a museum director. <laughs> so <clears throat> I knew I needed a really, yeah, as a really strong C CFO like I had in, in Louisa when I was here. And I've always felt that was, that was really critical because the art side, there were other sides I understood. The outreach side, the education side, I was passionate about. But I needed somebody who was really strong. But hiring a senior team, whatever, whether it's for profit or not for profit, I think is really critical because those are the people who you're going to work most closely with. <coughs> so uh, we're about the same vintage, Mimi. And uh, I know when I was starting out, there weren't very many senior women. Mm -hmm. uh, role models for us. There are some more for the women in the room now, though maybe, <coughs> alas, not as many as you and I might have hoped so many years ago. Um, do you have, did you in your career have any 
sort of barriers associated with being a woman leader, even in the arts world, there are not so many uh, women leaders. And actually, I think I, I think want you to dish a little. In other words, Mimi, you, you <laughs> <laughs> there actually are appallingly few female museum directors, particularly of major museums. I encourage any of you who want to be a museum director to get a degree in history of art and a degree in business and become a museum director, <laughs> be male or female. But it's, uh, there really uh, were appallingly few. And I, I was actually at a really interesting moment in time. I was just on the cusp of affirmative action. <coughs> so I'm not sure if that's the right way to describe it. I can remember having a, an interview with the Ford Foundation when I was doing dissertation research. And they said, can we ask you a personal question? I said, sure, you can ask me anything. And they said, will your husband ha help take care of your child? And I said, yes, of course he does. But I had had, actually, my father had said to me, all you need to do is have babies and get married. And so I immediately went in the opposite direction about having a career. And the more he said it, the harder I worked. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> something I, I, when people ask me what was the, princi my, the principle that governed my life, it was constructive rebellion. <laughs> so, and it, go it goes back to that time. And you know, I, you know, they put me in a girl's school and I went to Stanford. I wanted to go to the best co-ed school in the country. I actually wanted to come to Yale. But? <laughs> Yale didn't take women at that time in the early 60s. So I ended up at Stanford. But I, all the way along, I had a professor who, when I applied to graduate school in history of art, and it wasn't at this university, but screamed at the end of my nose to see if he could make me cry, and then said he had never had a woman student who was of any value whatsoever. Anyway, and then he wanted to introduce me to the head of the history of art department. He said, if you apply, I'll accept you. By that time, I decided I don't need this <laughs> and, and that I wasn't going to do that. Um, but, and I also had positive reinforcement. When I was appointed the director of the Yale Art Gallery, the vice chairman of the board came up to me, Arthur Alchel, and he said, isn't it great? that Yale appointed a woman director. And ever after that, I relaxed, and I didn't worry about it anymore. And I think, it's, I think what's hard is it often can be kind of under, under the table, and sometimes it's out front. Actually, one, the funniest thing, my, my first husband, who I'm still very fond of, but he said, women don't fish. And what's my passion? Fly fishing. <laughs> The minute we separated, I went fishing. <laughs> anyway, so, yeah, and, and I will say, it's important to have an avocation, to have things you love, like fishing. Chuck loves to fish, too. But, I, you know, I just, the gender issue, I, I think, is an important one, and it's often not explicit. I know when I interviewed for directorships that that's, people were thinking about that. And you know, I've heard other people say, well, no, this city wasn't ready for, for a woman director. And in Seattle, actually, I had a very funny thing happen, which somebody, uh, a, a person who became my best fishing pal on the board, a woman, said, much to the horror of everybody else on the search committee, do you have a boyfriend you can't leave behind? <laughs> and everybody on the committee sort of went, went down in their chairs. They were all mortified. And I mean, I could have sued them, but you know, that, I mean, I, that didn't matter. And I, I just smiled. I just didn't say anything because I knew I didn't have to. And <laughs> uh, later, anyway, later I, I told them I did. And they, and they said, don't worry, we'll find you another one of those. And anyway, and then when I got married, they said, we never knew we'd do so well. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was, uh, but I, I, I do think that for women, there still are barriers that are there. 
And I think particularly in the big museums to, to have strong women who lead them would be tremendous. And my hope is that this university trains some of those women to really play a leadership role in our great cultural institutions. Well, we have Gail Harrity, um, which, who I'm proud of. And That's great. We do have the gentleman who runs the Met. Alas, he is a gentleman, but he is never That's all right. That's all right. That's all right. Um, so what about boards, Mimi? You've been on many, many boards, and you've had boards to work with. And my own experience is that uh, you feel very differently about boards when you're managing your own than when you're being managed by somebody else because you're on his board or her board. Tell us some lessons. I think most of the young people here aspire to be on boards uh, someday. What lessons do you have about being a good board member, uh, looking at both perspectives? I think, um, I think if I take it from being on a board, is figuring out, is looking at what are the strengths? How can you contribute to the organization? How can you be a positive force? How can you work with the CEO or the director to influence where you have expertise and where you can be influential with other board members? And the fact that I was, that I am a former museum director gave me credibility or gives me credibility on arts foundation boards. I sit on the Tarot Foundation Board for American Art and also on museum boards. Uh, so I can, I can talk from the basis of my experience about, um, about that. And, but I think trying to work how to, how to move organizations in a positive direction and have everybody buy into the, the, the vision of the director. Uh, I, I think it really, we built a sculpture park in Seattle because everybody on the board bought into it. We were still finishing an endowment campaign, but the head of the board, who was a former president of Microsoft, uh, he had said that he would endow the operations of the park if I would raise the money to, build, to buy the land and build the park. And everybody just moved forward. And I think in terms of board perspective, that, that was really good. I think if, so being on a board, what speaks to you? I think it's important if you're gonna be on a board that the mission and values of the organization are something that matter to you, that you want to make a difference. Uh, there's no point in being on a board if, if you're not committed to that organization and its well-being. And how can you support the director, the CEO, the senior staff? How can you make a difference? I think that's really critical from the point of view of a board member. I think from the point of view of CEO is how can you form and really create a board that is strong, that is going to have the balance of expertise that you need? Do you need marketing expertise? Uh, art museums have collectors who also can help support it financially. But what else do you need? I, I also remember seeing an article in The New Yorker that on boards, it's really great to have somebody who's unexpected who people want to be with. And Meg Greenfield, who was the editor of the editorial page of the Washington Post, actually was on the Seattle Art Museum board. And she had no interest in art, but, but people loved her. And actually, sadly, she wasn't there very long. But uh, I, I think with board, forming a strong board, Nurturing and educating that board about the organization is really vital. Having good interpersonal connections with that board, uh, being able to talk to the different people, and to openly discuss differences of opinion. I did some of that uh, in the past two days. And having people talk about when they you know, think differently. And 
but being, a, being able to resolve differences and talk about them openly so that there's transparency. I think that's, uh, that's really important. And then strategic vision, having the board work with the director on strategic vision, and it should be the director who's the leader on the strategic vision. And the board members should understand the difference between governance and management. Mm -hmm. I think that's the other thing, is not having people on your board who are micromanaging your staff. And that's very disturbing. <laughs> so I, did, I didn't have very much of that. Yeah. I was lucky. Yeah, and sometimes the issue is either people are not involved in the organization or the way they want to get involved is micromanaging. And trying to keep people's interest at a strategic level, I think, is very difficult. But it sounds like you did well in your Seattle experience with that. Well, I was really lucky people didn't have agendas. They didn't have you know, singular. They really were looking at <clears throat> the well-being of the organization as a whole, how to grow it, how to grow it for the community. Uh, we diversified it a lot. We reached out a lot, which I thought was really important. Uh, and I think all of that has, has had a good effect. So maybe I want to talk a little bit about your work. So as you know, our dean, uh, Ted, has pushed the school hard in the area of globalization, and students are traveling all around the world um, as part of their international experiences. And you know, a way of thinking about what we're doing is globalizing our curriculum and connecting all the trade routes of the world. And your own work well, is looking at the Silk Road, one of the earliest right. of the trade routes right. of the world from the 200 BC, moving culture and trade through, the, through, the, through much of Asia. Talk to us a little bit about, I know you've been working on uh, Buddhism, Buddhist carvings yeah. in, uh, along the Silk Road. I'd love to hear a little bit about it and how you think about, and segue, use it to segue into the arts management kind of thing. How do we think about the role of the arts in a place like this? Well, having, having been in Chinese art, and when I stepped down as museum director, I was invited to give a paper in a place called Dunhuang, which is out on the Silk Road in, in northwestern China. And the academy asked me to come and talk about visitor experience there. And I got completely caught up. And it, it's an absolutely extraordinary site. It's a World Heritage Site with 735 grottos, of which 492 are filled with mural paintings and sculpture. So you have over 45,000 square meters of wall painting dating from the 4th to the 14th century. So it spans a millennium. And it was a major site for Buddhism as it came across. It was really the, the, the meeting point where Roman, Greek and Roman, Persian and Middle Eastern, Indian cultures met Chinese culture. And because it's just remote enough and just dry enough, those, that art has survived, which is really uh, uh, quite, quite miraculous. And so we're working to, uh, well, I'm working on several fronts with this, and the art is fantastic. I mean, it just, it, it is, some of it is so fresh with m mineral pigments that you just wouldn't believe it. Hmm. But I mean, it's just, it, it's the most important site on the Silk Road. And, uh, and you can, you know, it's, it's primarily Buddhist, and Buddhism was the most important foreign import into China, but it also, there are Hindu gods, there are, actually, there were 40,000 manuscripts found in the wall of a, a storeroom hidden behind a painting, and there were, there were Nestorian Christian texts, there were Jewish letters, there were, I mean, just an, a Zoroastrian mm -hmm. Manichaeism. I mean, all the, this fantastic intercultural blending that took place. So it's a global age like, like our global age. Exactly, and the bringing together of the meeting place of people from all over the world, sharing culture and sharing trade, is a sort of metaphor for what the Dean's trying to do here with MOOCs. Right. right. And, so, <laughs> and so it's funny, it's, it's just a different chapter of my life. And I run a small foundation that helps with conservation and training Chinese conservators and wall painting. 
by having people from the Courtauld and the Getty go there to help participate in the training. Uh, and we also help with professional development and people traveling and student fellowships, so we're building up that. And then the other big project I'm working on is an exhibition at the Getty Museum for 2000, summer of 2016 on the Buddhist caves. So how do you do an exhibition of Buddhist caves that don't travel? <laughs> Fortunately, there were these 40,000 things, so we're borrowing from England and France where they ended up. And how do you, how does this, tell me about the management of this kind of an exhibit. So if you said it's at the Getty, will it travel beyond the Getty? We, how do you decide that? We, how did you decide we, we, the Getty? Um, the Getty has done conservation work there for 25 years. Mm -hmm. So to celebrate the, the work they've done in partnership with the Dunhuang Academy, mm -hmm. they wanted to do an exhibition. And uh, the British Museum said they would participate, and so we've, um, and in the end, the Musée Guimet, the Bibliothèque Nationale. But these works are paintings on silk and paper, sketches, manuscripts from the 8th, 9th, and 10th century. The storeroom was sealed in around 1006. I think 1002 is the latest date in the, in the storeroom. So they're very fragile, so <clears throat> that actually precluded traveling. I see. But it's possible there also will be full-scale replica caves mm -hmm. that are hand-done, and there will be an immersive uh, virtual reality project. So you have different ways to experience Dunhuang. None of them are as, as moving as going and seeing it firsthand. But it's the best we can do. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to provide a variety of experiences and also teach people about cross-cultural connections at a relatively early period in time and how China played a vital role in that. And how much, as you managed people and the museums and all these things, you know, you came to art not looking at American art or even Western European art, but Asian art. And you're not Asian, so far as I know. No. Um, so you came to be excited and passionate about something that was outside of your own cultural world in some interesting way. How did that happen? How did you get interested in Asian art? And how much do you think that influenced your ability to open up to all kinds of people and experience life in a, in a very open way? And I think that has to do with risk taking. I think risk taking is so important and seizing opportunities. When an opportunity comes your way and you don't think that it's something that, um, that you think of passing it by, think, think twice. And again, it's constructive rebellion. My parents wanted me to spend my junior year in Italy. And I had a friend who was going to Japan for the summer. And they didn't want me to go. They wanted me to go to Italy. So they made me choose between the two. So I chose Japan. <laughs> so I ended up going to Japan for a summer and taking courses on Asian history. And I ended up with a great mentor in Asian art history at Stanford. And, <clears throat> and that really determined the trajectory of the rest of my life. And I started studying Chinese in 1962. Uh, in the only, the 23 years as museum director did not do any favors to my Chinese, but anyway. <laughs> uh, it did, did sort of get me in at an early stage. China was in the midst of the Cultural Revolution, so I couldn't go there, but I did end up going to Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And I think studying a foreign language, I think getting to know foreign, foreign cultures, I think it opens you up to the rest of the world, and no matter what aspect of business you're in, I think it, ser it will serve you well. And I think that is the principle behind the doing the globalization here as, as managers, recognizing that you know, it's like the Silk Road, for, uh, that business travels the world and learns from one culture and brings uh, to another culture. What about the connection between the arts and management? So we should expose them all to, to the world. I think we all agree with that. Do you imagine there are ways in which sending them all to Jacques Art Gallery, to have him come and lecture about art, to have them think about the role of images in the world? What does it do to a manager? I, I, I'm going to read my favorite Kirk Varnado quote, which um, is, he, he was 
curator at the Museum of Modern Art, and just a terrific person and scholar and art historian and curator, and he died far too young. But this is, uh, I think, just a terrific. He wrote, one of art's crucial functions, personally and socially, is to propose new worlds, different from the ones you know. And this is unsettling enough in itself. But perhaps even more crucially, and potentially more important still for society, art can make you pay attention to things you take for granted. Make what you think you know be strange to you, and thereby change your relation to life's actualities and possibilities. Oh, that's wonderful. I think, I think in terms of, I think art is about who we are. And you know, to some people it's music, and to other people it's theater or visual art. But I really think that, that through art, it enables you to develop your humanness and to develop your dimensionality. And I think, I mean, it would be interesting to know, yeah, I, I just am a, am a firm believer in the value of culture, the value of visual arts, its ability to touch and to develop. I, I'd, I'd be interested in the, the course, and maybe Jock can, or the, the one that I think the School of Management does an art course in the galleries. Mm -hmm. I've got a library membership in the school. Uh -huh. So we do um, the English literature as well as art and do four sessions of art. So how, how do you see the relationship between arts? Well, I think it's, um, it's pretty interesting because it gives you a different perspective than um, just other studies that are in Mm -hmm. which was being able to, for a year, to be able to zoom out of this everyday rut of business and talk about something that's bigger. Mm -hmm. Jack, I, I'm going to just, this is going to be a segue into now we're going to have a general conversation. That's great. Um, so, Jack. I just to follow up on the student's wonderful comment and say that one of the things that's interested me since I've been director is that uh, Chief Justice Stephen Breyer, when he brings the international Supreme Court justices from other countries to Yale often every other year, which he seems to do with some relationship with the law school, they, he first brings them to the art gallery. Mm -hmm. And their first day is spent going around the art gallery talking about the Yeah. I think the expression is there to be commentated, whether it's made fresh or whether it's made deep in time. One other thing I wanted, I wanted to ask you about, because I thought it was so important uh, when I came to Yale, um, and there were people like Louise E. Cunningham running the, the finances so well, and there was a wonderful board. It's the, in my sense, one of my real responsibilities is to think about succession planning, how to grow a board, how to build a mm. Yeah. 
you and I know a lot about. <laughs> and, and at the same time, make sure that that person that had experience working in the arts before she came here to get an MBA, and that was a godsend bit of succession planning on her part that I took to heart when I thought about mm -hmm. building a team, a team of poor management people. I have all of them were in their 30s to sort of 50s. They can all go for another 10, 15, 25 years as team. They want to stay together. The, the only thing you can't anticipate is how your successor will work with that team. I just want to say, I've been told you, you have little buttons and microphones, and we would like to record you for posterity. So as you chat, press your buttons. <laughs> I, I, I'd just like to weigh in on the succession thing, because I've seen this on the corporate side as well as uh -huh. the nonprofit side. And I think the hard thing is, working on your successor acknowledges your own uh, short time in the, left in the, in the term. And, and I find that is often gets in the way of grooming someone for the future is an unwillingness to let go yourself mm -hmm. from your position. Now you were in a position, how much time did you have between deciding you were going to Seattle and leaving Yale. I, I, I only had about four months. Actually, I had worked to get a sabbatical. <laughs> I had even, I, I, I had really worked hard, and I was going to take four months of a sabbatical, and on the way to the sabbatical, I accepted the Seattle job. <laughs> so you so, hadn't really anticipated maybe leaving as soon, but you no. knew to build a team anyway. But, I, but I, I just had naturally built a team. And it was, one thing that was very interesting about my time at the art gallery was the senior staff was curators. This, there was, the, that, that was, you know, it was, it was a little bit different. Louisa was the one person as the CFO who, uh, who was there. But uh, it, it was a little bit of a different, but I, I didn't have chance to think about my successor, and the one thing I felt badly about was the person who came between, who was between Jock and myself as director, was did did not work out well, and upset a lot of people. Jock called me and he said, "I've been offered this job," and I said, "You have to take it. You cannot turn it down." <laughs> And it's the best job. It's the, one of the best museum jobs in the country. It is. And the collections. People, the Yale Art Gallery's collections are triple the size of most, met, most cities in this country. Well, the other thing I want to say about this, too, is it's really important to be confident enough that you're going to be all right in what you do. That you like the person before you be there to give you advice. You'd like John mm -hmm. Walsh, the director of Artists to get He's also Yale alumnus to be on the board. Now that might threaten some people. They go, well, why would you want another two museum directors yeah. on board? You cannot imagine the value of time and talent that Amy and John Walsh have brought to our efforts because they can speak to these issues from their own knowledge of art, their own knowledge of education, their own knowledge of working with other entities. And so that's been, been a great boon. That, I mean, the, the function of the board here is so important too because you have a natural thing of people who love Yale, art collectors tend to have disposable. Mm -hmm. And there's a succession thing, whereas people get older from the classes. We saw it in your time from the classes of the 30s. Those people, Paul Mellon was mm -hmm. 29, they start to die off, ones from the 40s. So you're, you're having to look ahead a decade or two, always thinking about who are going to be your next trustees who also have a love of Yale and a caring for the institution. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, underway as, as, as you left. And we had a fantastic board chairman in Fred Mayer. Yeah. The value of increasing the endowment to give us more fiscal independence, knowing what had happened in some of the tough times you had to negotiate through fiscal. Right. And also knew that it was very important to diversify the board by gender, by collecting interest, by geographic distribution. You know, it gets back to I think that we learned a tremendous amount about management from the volunteer leaders who have been active in right. the kinds of businesses. Whoever's the chairman of the board is really important. And if you're the CEO, whoever is the chairman of that of your board, it's really important to have somebody who you can work with. I learned so much 
from a man named Walter Bryce when he was the chairman of the Art Gallery Board. And he taught me things like, you're going to make mistakes. Learn from your mistakes and then move on. Mm -hmm. Do not obsess. Far too many people make mistakes and then they obsess over their mistakes. He also was very funny on acquisitions of works of art. If you, if you miss out on one, he would say, there's always another bus coming, which, <laughs> which not everybody liked hearing. But I thought, I thought, I thought it, was, it was really good. But he taught me a lot about also staying cool. We had one, I mean, life was not all smooth sailing. And we had a huge incident over Richard Serra's sculpture. Mm. And I had stacks up under your, down. In the Concord Yard. Uh, and uh, it was in the sculpture hall. And this is within a university. And knowing the constituencies you have, who cares about your organization and how are they involved? And it was a contested area. It belonged to the museum but it was led to the history of art department. And when I had to learn, it probably was the hardest lesson and the most difficult moment I had when I was at, at Yale. He did a life-size maquette. I didn't say a word about it because he's a difficult personality and I didn't want to get embroiled in personalities. I wanted to let him, and he also went to the Yale School of Art and is probably the preeminent sculptor of the 20th and 21st century. I didn't realize he was a Yale person. Yes. Oh, my, my. And actually he did, he, uh, it was the Yale School of Art, and, and which is something that distinguished Yale is that you know, it was a class of Bryce Martin, Ryan and Bob and Sylvia Mangold and Chuck Close, and you know, it was brilliant. But we wanted him to have something at Yale. And this actually came from the board, a lot of the, the inspiration for it. But the faculty decided I'd taken them lightly. So they rose up and called the president, uh, who was then Benno Schmidt, and, and asked him to veto the project. And actually, the chairman of history of art, who had been my, dis my advisor in graduate school, called me and said, you're about ready to step in the fast lane of I-95. <laughs> anyway, I mean, there were all sorts of things that were going on. And President Schmidt said to me, hey, just don't do it now. Let's wait till after commencement. And then I'll meet with you before <laughs> I go on summer vacation. We had a, an arrangement with the artist that we would meet with him that we would make a decision by July 1st. But Benno Schmidt left on vacation without meeting with me. So then what was I to do? And so the chairman of the board said, we'll do it. We're yeah. going to go with Richard Serra. So we did. And uh, there was, uh, and actually, um, the, other, the other thing I forgot to mention was Benno Schmidt asked the chairman of the department if I would resign if he vetoed the project. And that got relayed back to me. And one thing was really good, I learned never to be afraid of being fired. You know, I had to come to terms with it, and I decided if I was fired from being the director of the Yale Art Gallery, it was going to be all right. I'd get another job, I'd do have another chapter, but I would be fine. But it was a fairly, it was a heated moment. And the, I went on vacation, and the minute I came back, I, the president wanted to see me. <laughs> so, uh, but, there's nothing like a small-minded professor, is all I can say. Me well, there, there was a, a whole group. <laughs> a group of small-minded professors. And I did have the Yale School of Art, the head of the sculpture department, who was actually was dying of cancer, stood on his crutches and said, I wish I had been asked. To, to do a site-specific piece here. I would have given my eye teeth, but he said, you have a chance here to make a great decision for this university. And he said that to the board of the art gallery. And in the end, we did it. I see a little bit about that confrontational courage you've got there, maybe. Well, anyway, perseverance. Questions and comments from the students. Yes, please. Um, 
being a woman and growing up in China, I found your experience ex especially um, inspiring and encouraging. Uh, in the light of the recent um, Asia Week, very successful in New York, uh, mm -hmm. mostly due to the uh, amazing Ro uh, Robert Ellsworth collection, I was just wondering, is there any specific uh, challenges you see um, that the uh, Asia art is facing? Well, I think just the prices. <laughs> Uh, it's just Asian art has gone through the roof because of the number of Chinese collectors who are now interested in investing in Chinese art, and so that is a major, a major issue. Um, but I think in terms, so that's I think for collecting is, is a problem both for institutions and for private collectors. That's hard. Yes. Um, I'm actually wondering about that question as well. The, in terms of the future of collecting, how can an institution that's a little bit smaller than, say, the Met um, or even Seattle, how can they work to grow without having those big acquisition budgets? I think if you have individuals in your community fostering collecting mm -hmm. amongst them and loyalty to the institution, is a way that you really can work that way. Um, and, and also finding areas of expertise. What, what area can you focus on where you're going to be able to collect? Contemporary prints, photography? Photography was an area that was actually affordable. That's changing too. But, I think trying to figure out what, what's going to be the shape of the collection, what's the mission of the institution, who do you want to reach. But I, the, the personal part of drawing in individuals in that community to care about the institution is, is really of, of utmost value. Yes, over here. What experiences can you share around the benefits and challenges of nonprofit consultants? Of nonprofit consulting? Consultants. Yeah. On Did you hire plans. any consultants at Seattle or at Yale, and were you pleased with them, or were they useless? I, yes. <laughs> Some of them were useless. <laughs> and expensive. No, actually, we had. Um, I, the consultants that immediately come to mind were fundraising consultants in Seattle who, who said that we could not, that we could not raise $10 million right. for the museum to build our endowment. And like Jock, I feel I, I am totally committed to building endowment because once it's there, it's there. And the chances of the financial markets being okay, at least, you know, it, it's something on which you can depend. These consultants said we couldn't raise 10 million, and in the end, we raised 60. But um, it, it's, it, I think, if you if you have a real need and you don't have expertise, you know what you want from a consultant, and the consultant's good, and the consultant's going to do a good job. I, an area where uh, it's valuable is museum security. Because you have to have a secure institution, you have to have good uh, electronic security guards and the whole thing. And, and that area, and we did it at Yale, was to have somebody who is the kind of national you know, person come in and evaluate and make suggestions. And that's an area that is very good. But I think you have to know what you want and know that that person is good. <coughs> yes, here. So at, at the very beginning, uh, Professor Oster mentioned our new building as sort of a work of art. Mm -hmm. uh, aside from our vibrant murals on the first floor, there really is no other art here. Uh, and so can, thinking about the work you did in Seattle, the sculpture park and the museum, what do you think, and, and also in the context of getting more art uh, into the School of Management beyond just an elective course that only a few people might self-select to take. Uh, what do you think would be the role of art in the building, and what would you like to see here? Can I, can I just say something we're doing? So uh, there's a little committee of us. We've been to the Peabody in the basement and, I, and are trying to arrange some, some take 
part of their collection that's not shown and bring it to us. We've talked to um, uh, people in the art school about having using some of the walls as student shows. Um, both maybe, in, you know, some of the student stuff is maybe not so appropriate for a business school. It's a little out there, at least for the public spaces. But some of it is quite. But that may be fine. That may open their thinking. Yeah, that you're thinking. Good. So uh, we are we are working on all those empty walls. But I'd like to hear Mimi too, and I completely <laughs> concur. They're empty, and it's a terrible thing and to have spaces. those empty walls. Yeah. yeah. I, I, you know, I, and you, you probably should talk to Jock as well about, but it, you know, I, I think that art, that, I think it has a, a definite effect on the culture of the institution as well as in individuals. And to have, have, have art and, you know, it can be changing, it can be prints, you know, there are things that are affordable that, that can be up, although light is an issue. Yes, but. and that here, when we had people come, the, it, it is a little tricky because of the, it's so open and bright that a lot of stuff would get ruined. But the other thing, I mean, there are forms of art that, sculpture? Well, you have that big green space, you could be rotating. Yeah, we, we're, we've got our eye on a big, Azt, big Aztec head. And then there's some dinosaurs. I'm telling you, I think it'd be fabulous. I think it'd be great to have and, a dinosaur. And, and there's a whole, and there's a, I don't know, there's a whole, yeah. Well, there's a whole set of discussions about how the finding of all those fossils were, uh, were made possible by the development of the railroad because you could move all the stuff back and forth. Thank you. Well, we were hoping people wouldn't go there. Actually. Yes, that's really good about the. <laughs> We were hoping Extinct they wouldn't be quite species. so literal. Uh, yeah, there? I think it's worth though. It's worth thinking about because the environment in which all of you study, and so you know, how can you make it better? I will say one other thing. I think it's really important, whether you're the CEO of a for-profit or not-for-profit, in terms of never being complacent. That's one thing this guy never is. Is how can you make it better? How can I make it better? And always thinking, you know, in that, in that way. And not being afraid to take risks and not being held back by fear. And, and, and we have another minute or two, but are these your last words, Mamie? No, uh, uh, the, please. Well, I'll like tell you, to give you the last few minutes. I'll tell you, I'll tell you but the, last, but the last word would be my favorite quote from Kay Graham. Uh, who wrote in, in her personal history, she, and she was a, a personal friend, but she, uh, she, she said to, to love what you do and know that it matters, what could be more fun? And I'd end with that. And I'm hoping that you all begin with that, because I think that is the beginning of finding a passion and a career and something that will make us all proud as you go off. Uh, as well. Mimi, right. it's been a pleasure thank you, to have you, and thank you for being a good audience. No. Bravo. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>